standard two-hour session. Uh, my name is Luke. Um, I'm from St. Giles Trust. I'm one of the lead facilitators uh, and mentors for the charity. Um, I've been here for over a year and it's an absolute joy to work for an organisation that can use some unfortunate truths that have um, once exist um, that once took prevalence in my life and we can use that as a curriculum to really shine light on this very real topic. Um, I'm not too sure if you guys are aware, but today is actually CCE Day, um, Child Criminal Exploitation Day. So what a day to do it, a day where we can um, really dive into the reality of young people being exploited into county lines and serious youth violence. Um, so as I'm reading your, you guys' intro, introductions, I see a lot of safeguarding leads. I see a lot of, I see a few nurses, uh, social care workers. This is quite quite a great this is a, this is a very great group because um we're working directly with the young people aren't we so it's really uh, important that we have a wide space perspective so thank you guys for joining um, um i am based in london um however i travel across the country delivering these sessions and one of the things that i've really come to know um about these sessions is essentially um we can't we can't generalize any of these thing of these things so i'm gonna yes i'm gonna be going through a presentation however it's, it will really be excited if i can hear from you guys throughout the course of today's training and get an understanding of the work that you're doing and how we can really um how we can really focus in um so just a few few ground rules as everyone's kindly already doing the chat function is going to be our main line of communication uh i am a dynamic speaker i love to engage i would love to see your faces as well if only i could get a train to Walsall and myself kelly and we could book out a room and see you guys face to face that is my kind of show however the new, the recent times we're in hey come on come on hey, come on lovely lovely to see you, alice um, it makes it so much more dynamic, it makes it so much more interesting. Um, it isn't compulsory. And of course, I know because we most of us are at the comfort of our homes. If there's any time you want to take a break from your screen, stand up, do something crazy that you don't want no one else to see, like just but please, 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 like do come and um please feel free to show your faces so it really helps me out. Um come on, the party's getting started lovely join through join through isn't it better um essentially today is going to be broken into two halves so what i'm going to do just confirm with me you guys can see the learning outcomes right now um just uh, by a show of hands perfect yeah so a learning outcomes for those that are just in this session they're thinking oh what is this really going to be about essentially we are looking at count a uh, criminal uh, child criminal exploitation but our focus our example today is county lines and essentially there's a lot of different spaces young people can be exploited but what we're seeing happening very prevalent in the past decade is county lines so we're going to be looking at the lens of county lines and showing how that trades off with other like um criminal activities but I'm not going to bore you today by telling you what County Lines is. I'm sure that many of you, if not all, already know where it is. My job today is to look at the hows and the whys. OK, County Lines is this. Uh, distribution of class A drugs. OK, but what does that look like? How is it being set up and why is it affecting so many young people across this country? How is it affecting them as well? We want to really dive into that and start to look at the push and pull factors. Yeah, I don't really want to regurgitate any textbook style information to you guys. I really want to give you lived perspective. And what I'm going to be doing is leaning on my lived experience because unfortunately everything I've spoken about today, I've lived firsthand. Um, I travel across the country sharing my story in aim for no young person to have to go through some of the traumatic experience that I did. And it's really important that we really look at the heart of the issue. So I'm going to be lead. I might I may digress and I may I may I may just really because this is ever growing and ever changing. I may digress and I'll put myself back into the victim seat and I really want us to understand the mindset of that young person because it's only a matter of time if they choose these unfortunate decisions that they themselves become perpetrators and we will be exploring that victim perpetrator overlap so um so the first half is going to be very practical looking at how county lands are set up how young people are being uh, um recruited and then um 
then um this sorry i should say the first half is more formal it's like we're really going to be a lot of information overload i'm going to speak in text um for note takers if if there's any important things i suggest you guys to note down i would say um and then the second half just just after three o'clock we're going to then look into more less of the function of county lines more of the young person and that's going to look at the realities or consequences what is the young person actually going to see what are they going to feel um um, oh, um how is this going to how is this going to affect their around their surroundings that's when we start to look at the signs and indicators um and what can we do to essentially support them and that's going to look at the solutions because a lot of today is going to be doom and gloom when we start speaking about these very real things it's heavy so we want to hopefully fingers crossed everybody fingers crossed we'll have enough time to leave up positively at the end we're just discussing some of the solutions that will also be a time for question and answer i'm sure many of you may have questions we want to spend some good time at the end just to really dive into that and then we can get ready for our friday evening come on all right so um yeah that's the introduction that's the the learning outcomes we are on teams so if anyone does have questions it's what's best for you you can even raise your hand um you can even jump in if you really want to ask a question i'm a chatty guy so let's talk um or if you just really want to articulate your question in a formal way feel free to write it in the chat box send it through and we'll answer it when appropriate um we will take a comfort break um, around three o'clock as well just so we can stretch our legs so before we dive in there's only one more thing i have to ask for um of course because we are online um i'm going to be sharing a lot of my story a lot of personal a lot of sensitive stuff if we can just um restrain from any recordings um that would be a great privilege um or, but if you do love if you do want to use the slides um or you would like the resources that we're sharing today um there will be an opportunity at the end um for either me to collect your emails or probably i would send it over to kellyanne and she can dispel it to you guys so rest assured you can get the resources so just sit back and in joy what you're looking at on the screen right now is saint giles uh, is a saint giles map saint giles is a charity that was started in 1960 uh, a charity that works with the most marginalized and at risk in society yeah uh, an individual was inspired once upon a time to set up this charity to support the homeless to support those that were worth wrestling with the criminal justice system those that had adverse child um, childhood challenges and so forth and what we started to see over the years progressing, I say we, like I was there at that point of time, history, memory lane. But what we saw as a charity happen is essentially um, we saw a lot of these individuals that were wrestling with adverse uh, uh, experiences happen to be connected with the criminal justice system. We started to see our work start to go into prisons and we were working with offenders. And... Um, we started to work around rehabilitation and essentially our work was inspired um a project was inspired called the sos so the sos project is a project that works with offenders that are coming up come out of prison they need support back into living standards uh housing employment and so forth but then this greater question happened 10 years ago or maybe coming to 15 years ago now which was how can we earlier intervene we all heard that lovely buzzword come around like how can we help these individuals before they do the crime and the time it's an important question and an individual called junior smart uh, decided to take the sos project further by introducing the sos plus project and this is what today's training is training is coming out of i work in the department of sos plus which is essentially a part of the pro a project that goes earlier um into the these individuals lives to debunk them of uh, to remove the the risk of them getting involved in the first place so how does this look me going into schools me going into ed educational settings and telling these young people the truth and now i'm going to start my session because we all know what the truth is uh today's world glamorizes drug distribution today's world glamorizes uh violence we think it's cool the average young man has seen the, a young man or young woman has seen a knife on social media they've seen someone been stabbed on twitter they've seen these videos that glamorize violence in music videos such as drill 
let's talk about it. And because of that, what we are dealing today with as professionals is a glamorized and normal, normalized um, frame, frame of activity. So my job, our job is to go into these spaces and remove these lies because they're only seeing the entertainment side. They're not seeing the reality side. So with our lived experience, St. Giles is going into these spaces and telling these these young people the absolute truth because they've seen the react they've seen the themes of it already it's our job to tell them the truth and we do this to young kids we do this with young kids as early as year fives um obviously changing the filtering the amount how deep we can go depending on the age group we do this with parents and we do this with professionals such as yourself so our job and i say this because this is the context of today's training guys as we go into this we're looking at all of this information how do we how does this apply to our work to that young person that needs support that needs awareness that needs uh, intervention and so forth yeah this is why we're really here so i don't want to talk from a, a professional hat and forget that it's the young person that is being being approached by these strangers that claim to be their big brothers um we need to think of those people so that's given me the energy I need to start the session. Um, so let's get into the session. Um, hopefully you guys are excited. You guys are ready. If you are, I'm going to press right and then I'm going to go to the first slide. I need 20 of you guys to just let me know in the chat function if you're ready by saying let's go. Exclamation marks if you're extra excited. Right in the chat, fill my cup with caffeine because it's not really kicking in. Emma says, let's go. Claire says, let's go. Let's go. Oh, my gosh. Oh, amazing stuff. I love the energy. I love the energy. Honestly, when you do this every day, you need it. All right, cool. While you guys are next to your screens and you're typing away, help me ask this question because it's an important one. When did you, who's typing on the screen, let's go. When did you first hear about County Lines? When did that first hit your radar? Uh, how long ago is has it been? Is this a new term to you? Is our old term? If so, when did you first hear about this term, county lines? Okay, Michelle says five years, two years from Beverly. Okay, okay, Kerry, six years. Okay, okay, anyone got more than six? I feel like I'm bidding. Eight years from Jan, 10 years from Kerry. All right, so Kerry, we have a win. I'm going to just give you host and you can just do this session, Carl. Essentially, you've known it longer than me. Uh, if you turn around, I would have said something like six years. Um, so we're talking to OGs in the room. OK, amazing stuff. Um, yeah, if you ask me when I first heard about it, I would have said something like six, seven years. I remember exactly when I first saw it as a term come up and come up on my radar. And I was in my living room. Uh, there was a I hope you guys can see me. OK, the glaze from my screen. It's like heavenly. It's amazing. I'm sure when I start telling my story, it's going to just go dark and it's going to get serious. But anyways, I digress. But essentially, um, yeah, I remember I was watching a BBC documentary and I remember the big, bold writing, County Lines. I had no idea what it was going to be about. I remember sitting down and it's only in the first few minutes when we see that introductory part of the documentary, we start to see all of the themes that are going to be spoken about. I started to see train lines and young people wearing uh, black clothes and I was seeing drugs on the table and a knife and I saw the powder, I saw the crack cocaine and the heroin and as soon as I saw all of this stuff, I was just like, oh, they're talking about cunch. <laughs> they're talking about OT. I was like, what's this county lines term? And I started thinking, oh, this is this is new. And essentially, this county lines term threw me off. But essentially, for a young person that like for like me, when I hear county lines, I'm like, I, I'm I'm to a young person, when we think about the distribution of class A drugs, which is what county lines is, we call that cunch. We call that going quay, upsa, OT. We're going country. Yeah, OT standing for out, out of town or out there. These are the colloquialisms. These are the slang terms that these young people are going to use. This is our first lesson very quickly. When we think about the young people today, they're not calling it county lines. This is a professional term. And it's a professional term that has been around for coming up to 10 years now. But when we actually explore, which we're about to do in a moment, when we actually explore what county lines is, this isn't actually a term or uh, this is actually, this isn't a process or a phenomenon that has been around for 10 years. We're talking in the past four or five decades. As long as there's been satellite connections with phones, there's been county lines, which is now making us play catch up. 
because essentially with the things that was being described in the documentary as county lines is a whole life a generational pass down of a system yeah that's been around and it's matured and developed over time and i like to see today's today's county lines operation as like the fourth fifth generation because it's changing again. The past two years, County Lines has changed again. It's no longer just gangs coming from one city going out. Now it's um, now it's um, essentially um, going into these areas and setting up, grooming young people internally, locally. It's no longer these gangs going as a group. You may have one or two going into these areas, moving there and setting up a system there where they're grooming kids locally. I digress, we're gonna go into that. But essentially there's, it's county lines is maturing so let's define it very quickly just for those that perhaps haven't heard about it before county lines distribution of class a drugs what drugs crack cocaine and heroin for me i would call it well once upon a time we was told it's called light and dark yeah the light being the crack cocaine the dark being the heroin the light being the drug that makes these drug users wide awake they're electric in energy they're buzzing so much so that now their mental is just going left and right they're overthinking and then eventually they say oh take the dark it will calm you down it will bring you back into your slow your karma state because you can't function on that level all the time i saw that happen i would see how a drug user would become alive with energy and then would start to desire the brown or the dark and it would just put them in this into this vegetable vegetable state or maybe they start snowballing and they take the crack cocaine and the heroin mix it together and inject themselves in the arm and they pass out in seconds and essentially these are the drugs we're talking about murderous drugs yeah drugs that we've seen as peanut shaped skittle sized drugs they look harmless to them to the human eye you know but essentially um when we actually when i told a young person i say yeah when you see a thousand of these on the table these little 10 pound wraps they look like they look like skittles you know because the crack cocaine was in blue nylon bags wrapped in cling film the 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 heroin was in i remember ripped up sainsbury's bags orange and they were in cling film as well they looked like skittles and i remember i'm telling a young person it's nothing but it's not it's nothing of the sort because essentially these are the same drugs that i've seen young i've seen i've seen a 40 year old old on so what are we saying what how are we presenting this we these are the these are this is the reality this is the the, the these are the drugs we're talking about but okay we know what it is so these drugs are being distributed across the country and i would just like us to bring our focus to the infographic on the screen the map i believe you can see it just let me know if i need to zoom in as well at any point um but essentially we're looking at this infographic on the screen and what you would see is uh london in the middle of the map right and you would see arrows coming out of london pointing into different counties and this is a this is a clear example of what's going to happen so in london our major city we're going to have what we like to call a gang professionals like to call it ocns if you're writing it down an ocn organized crime network but they we for me it's a gang and these gangs and it's in, i feel like it's become helpful to see it as an ocn because there's different levels of gangs just because your young person says they're in a gang that doesn't mean they're in an ocn an organized crime network is a systematic it's a systematic um a ranking gang there's ranks there's olders or elders there's people there's higher up there's a hierarchy there's there's where you can come up in the ranks so i so an an organized crime network they are they are they function off making money they're not just a gang that are involved in asp asb anti-social behavior they they need to sustain themselves they have a luxury lifestyle they have um they have security they have weaponry all of these things so they need to sustain themselves as a gang how do they do that by making money making money through all of these various criminal exploits uh, burglary robberies um and of course drug distribution so uh, ocn is what we're talking about today because essentially gangs that's you know some of you some of y'all in the room are calling yourself i'm going out some of you are going out with your gang tonight for a for a little in <laughs> i am so happy i'm happy you know because i've had the longest week 
And I don't know, the energy in the room is giving, it's the sunlight, it's the sunlight, guys. I digress, apologies. Um, so we're talking about the movement, yeah? So this OCN, not just a normal gang, we're talking about this organised crime network, they are situated where? In the city. In the city. This could be London, like on the map, but we could have changed that to any major city in the country, guys. Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, wherever. We're seeing the same thing. In these cities, you're going to have an organised crime network and they're going to begin to branch out. Arrows will go into different counties and this is what county lines is. The slang term OT is one of the slang... The slang term OT stands for out of town. As a young person involved in this gang or organised crime network, they're going to go out of their London town, out of their Birmingham town, and they're going to go into another town, a county town, Thames Valley, areas in Wiltshire, Hampshire, Buckinghamshire, anything with a shire at the end. You're going to see it with Kent. You're going to see all of these areas, Essex or Walsall. And you're going to see these areas where gangs, o o o OCNs, are going to go into these territories and they're going to set up shop. Luke, you've been talking a lot now. So in this next part, I'm going to ask you guys, why does this happen? These gangs, okay, gangs are taking these drugs and they're going to distribute them into different counties. But why? What's their incentive? Let me know in the chat function. Let's flood this chat with reasons. Why are we seeing gangs leave their immediate city and go into areas such as your own, like Walsall? Why do we see this happen? Any thoughts? Territory, greed, well, there's an obvious one, of course, as well. Money, there it is. Increased profit, money sense, absolutely. Greed, that's a deeper one. Unknown to the police, absolutely. Make more money, absolutely. So, of course, money. So, if in terms of all the reasons that you're saying that are correct, um, we see a top three happening, why this is really happening. And I ask this because I think it's really important for us to get into the mind of these drug dealers, essentially, who were once victims. These drug dealers have many reasons made it why they may want to branch out. And, of course, one of them is money. And essentially, the next slide, we're going to look at how much money they essentially are making. Because, effectively, a successful county lines operation is making anything write this down, from 1,000 to 3,000 pounds a day in 2022. When I was selling drugs, when I was involved, it was a grand. If you made a grand a day, you were killing it. Now it's up to three grand and potentially even more. That's 800 grand annually. Then we start to look at the number of nines across the country. We think about the millions and million, millions of taxpayers' money that's going into county lines. So what's one of the reasons, if you're taking note? Financial opportunity. Why is this happening? Because there's a huge demand for these drugs in these remote areas. And unlike a metropolitan city like London, where there's so much, um, so much people, so much uh, uh, drug dealers, let's just talk about it, there's not a lot, there's a lot of options. So what essentially is happening, there's a lot of competition in London. But where these gangs are leaving and going into areas like, um, going into areas like Warsaw and they're going into these different spaces, they're going to go into these places and there's not going to be as many drug dealers. So when they go into this area, now they're going to exploit it by driving up the demand, driving up the price. These drugs are being sold for five times, six times as much as what they would have been sold for in London financial opportunity new uh, another one very important with all the ones that have been said jan hit the nail on the head unknown to the police the local constabulary it's a huge deterrent for gangs to stay in their area because the police know them every time i went into the town center when i would go out and i'm with my friends i'm with my gang essentially the police know us our name they know our story they're watching us even when we're not doing anything it makes it difficult for these gang members so what do they do they pack their bag and they go to an area where no police know them they go to an area where there's a lower police force they go to an area where they can just um just fit underneath the radar with no one seeing them, knowing their uh, situations. And that's that's another reason we're seeing a lot of these county line operations set up in these remote remote areas, low crime areas, you know, areas like Norwich, you know, where you can play police car no returns because the number of police cars I was seeing in, 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 in an hour is ridiculous. I wouldn't see them. And these are the areas that perhaps these gangs want to go to because they know, OK, there's not a lot of police there. But of course, those are the two. 
And then there it is. I thought we didn't say it. Alice hit the nail on the head. Gang conflict. 100%. That's our third and final one we're going to talk about. Gang conflict. So I'm sure we're all aware of post-Cold Wars. Post-Cold Wars exist in the area. Post-Cold War is, um, is a personal rivalry between one gang and the other. It's personal. Family members, loved ones have died on each side. They're notorious for knowing each other, for, for scoring points, what these rappers say now. We score points against each other. Who has Who's done more... Who has committed more violence against the other? It's personal, but you know the and and when you have a lot of post cold wars, it makes it difficult for you to expand your market because essentially every time these gang members want to go into another area within London, they're running into someone they may have conflict with. Makes it very difficult for them to build their empire, make money. What happens when a young person that now is involved in a gang because of association now is being identified as someone that is a target? So now this young person doesn't feel safe in their area. So now even this young person is being coached with their gang to say, bro, this is why you need to go up to Norwich. This is why you need to go up to, um, to, to, to Suffolk. You've got to go to these areas and essentially no one knows you there. So go there because you can make more money and no one will step on your toes. And this is essentially what's happening. And now it's even developing over the years now, where now gangs want to go into these areas and they don't only want to avoid competition, they also want to become the lead, uh, the, the lead representative of that territory. They want to go to these areas and they want to be the higher power. There's no one to step on my toes, so I'm going to be the boss. And then now essentially, like it happened, not it's hap essentially it's a really popular in um in Leeds, where essentially gangs are going into certain areas and it's like we're the only gang here. So now these young people, young kids are seeing these big groups, and essentially there's no one to give, run them out of the area, and now they're forced to just join them. And they join the family and they become a part of that clique and a part of that group. Um, and essentially this is what will happen as well So why is this happening? I'm just warming your heads up We're saying essentially we see, okay, money of course Profitability, we see the police And we see local conflict And of course all the other points that you guys have raised Are sound as well But this is all So we've already started to look at the why now Yeah, we know what county lines is And now we've looked at some of the why um, Hopefully this is um, this is helpful for you guys But what I want to do now Is very quickly I want to now look at the what I want to look at Okay How is this being set up now What is county lines in terms of Sorry not the what The how How we do How does this really happen In the first place And what to How we do that Is really looking at the process I know many of you guys uh, I just feel many of you guys May um, um, Know Like You may know a lot of this um, because of the years that I'm just hearing about. So what I want to do is really just whistle through it. Um, but if there's any questions that you've had or want to really further insight you want on any of the four components, this is a really interactive part where you can let me know. So instead of me just like, yeah, patronising and just speaking it around, I want us really to look at this as a world in itself and see how we can really work more effectively around this because... Essentially, guys, no county lines operation can run effectively without these five components. There's five components to how a county lines is set up. There's the county town. There's the there's the phone pro. There's the phone line. There's the cuckoo property. There's the recruitment and there's the transportation. Essentially, if we want to disrupt county lines, if we want to stop it from happening, we need to disrupt one of these components. And essentially, you can't have a, a, a fully functioning operation if one of these components is taken out. So, um, yeah, let's make this fun. Does anyone want to give us an example of a county town? Something that's been on their radar? Um, something, uh, a real example of a county town? Just let me know in the chat. We'll scream it out. Just read your comment, Kerry. Kerry, absolutely. Um... For local rural people in rural areas who are then cocooned. Yeah. Absolutely. Oxford. Oh, Oxford. <clears throat> yeah, we could do Oxford. Thank you, Emma. Um, yeah, Oxford. 
interesting fact with Oxford, um, definitely is a is a bit. Ah, oh, did you see it? Did you see the sunlight just go? Just went. Ah, oh, this feels better. Feels cooler now. Um, and that's how I know we're getting serious. Um, so Oxford, essentially, um, there's a rapper called Asko that's been imprisoned. Um, some of you may know him. Really popular artist, glamorized county lines. He's been arrested, incarcerated for over, I think he's doing um, like 10 years in prison. And essentially his sis, his county lines, uh, I've just been told from the police, and then I did a talk with the police, it's still running. It's still running, even while he's in prison. What are we saying? We're seeing the fact that how are we, are we disrupting? It, it, it's funny because out of the five processes, none of them is the actual employer. None of them is the actual um, founder of the operation. We don't see that. So even if you remove these drug dealers, the main person, we can still have a fully functioning operation and that's something to bear in mind. But okay, Oxford, all of these are great. Um, Somerset as well, different areas, definitely. So Oxford, easy to get to, accessible. You know, if you're coming from an area like Birmingham, like all London, if you're a gang from London, you can essentially get to a, King, a King's Cross um, or you can get a coach um, from Victoria. Um, very accessible. You can even drive there in under two hours. So this is these may be all the reasons and Incentives, these gangs, this OCN say, let's go Oxford. Yeah. So they're going to go Oxford. And essentially, for those that are wondering, how do they even just find out the locality or how do they even know how to set up from scratch? A lot of these uh, um, operations are being set up from, in, um, from inspiration from prisoners. Uh, people have been arrested, they've gone prison, and then in prison, I like to call it a criminal LinkedIn. You're going into prison, you're connecting with new people and you're learning why they got inside. Oh, where did you go? Oh, County Lines. Oh, where was you? Where was you at? Oh, Oxford. Oh, really? Is it popping down there? Yeah. Yeah, I can tell you where every all of the spots are. And now essentially someone's getting on the phone and they're saying, yo, bro, you need to get down to Oxford. And with all of this, things can start to germinate. Or maybe they go there, they see a drug user, have a conversation. And now essentially they're just finding out more about um, the location. <laughs> So there's so many reasons you can find out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it, I'm going to create, um, I'm going to make up a drug dealer. We're going to call this drug dealer S. This drug dealer's S. Maybe his real name is Sean. He's short, shorting it down. He's called S. Sorry, there's any Sean's here. I can't see no Sean's. So yeah, there's an S. So S is going to go into Oxford. He's found out, found out about the area. The first thing that S wants to do as a drug dealer is to set up a market base. He wants to set up his market. He wants to find his customers. Yeah. He's going to go into this Oxford. He's going to go into this area in Oxford and he's going to look for these drug users. Quick question to the chat. Where is he going to find them? Where is he going to find these drug users? I'm a drug dealer called S. I've come into Oxford. I have my drugs. I need to find out who needs these drugs is there a demand for these drugs what type of areas do you think that s is going to go to let me know in the chat what type of areas where in oxford where am i gonna go on the streets where on the streets the streets come on give me some areas nightclubs mm, close maybe more pubs rather than nightclubs why because we're talking about a poverty drug we're talking about a drug that is dealt with the more older ages. They're not really partying. They want to be inside all day smoking their crack spliff. So we need to say where they're going to go. Parks, absolutely. In the town centre, where? Maybe in the corners. Drug re re rehabilitation centres, absolutely. Thank you, Emmy, Emma. Um, job centres, absolutely. We're thinking about dep deprived areas. Areas where there's not a lot of, a lot of opportunity, a lot of money. Homeless areas, absolutely. Homeless shelter, true stories. We would stand outside a homeless shelter where they're doing their soup kitchens, saying, you don't want that, we have what you want. Essentially, rehabilitation centres, absolutely. Pharmacies, where these drug users are going to get their methadone to try to cancel out their drugs. Yeah, we're going to go to the pharmacy, the GP. We're going to go to the, uh, the bookies, house in the States. Absolutely, yeah. We're not talking about grooming yet. So we're not going to be going to youth clubs and schools. That's for young people. We're talking about the drug user. Yeah. What we like to call as as young as uh, what the young people like to call as uh, nitties or cats or crackheads. 
yeah? We're talking about the consumers of these drugs, house and estates, absolutely. Bookies. If you want to write all of these down, it's helpful. Because essentially, homeless shelters, absolutely. All of these things that you're saying, guys, everything I've just said is known as the hot spots. These are called hot spots. And the process of a gang going into Oxford or whatever county town it is, is called hotspotting. They're going to go into the area and they're going to intentionally go into popular spaces, hotspots, where they find drug users. And they will do this for a few days to a few weeks. And they will do this and have conversations. You're right, you're right mate. you got a cigarette. You spare me a lighter. They exchange a cigarette. Now they're smoking. Now they're talking. Oh, it's a good day. By the way, bro, is what, what, what else you smoke? They talk, now they're talking about crack cocaine and heroin. Now they're saying, yeah, I got what you want. And then they pull out a sample. They pull out a sample because in the hot spotting process, it's going to be all about sampling. You're going to go there with what we call TT. TT means 10 out of 10. You're going to get a high, a very uh, a TT 10 out of 10 means it's been uncut. It hasn't been washed with cutting agents. It hasn't been mixed with bicarb. It hasn't been broke, washed down. What we're going to do in the first pro first hot spot, in, and this is important in a moment, I'm going to tell you why. Essentially, these drug dealers are going to come with a very um, high quality version of the drug. So it gets people hooked on the drug. They're going to give this for free as a sample. Here you go. If you like what you take, if you like what, you, what I've just given you, give me a call later. And why don't you tell your mates as well? And essentially now they go take it and then they have they retake the drug. Now they start telling all their friends. And then I might S might bribe them and say, you know what, if if you give if you give me 10 of your friends' numbers, I'll give you another, I'll give you another tester. And this is how they start to build a line or they build uh, um, their market in their area. And they will do this throughout. And then when they finally have an operation, you will see how the quality of that drug changes. They start washing it with bicarbonate and they start to sell it for this uh, bog standard version. And this is the one that's going to even start to affect them even more. And they're going to do that just to stretch their profitability. Yeah. So this is all called hotspotting. They'll do that for a period of time as, uh, until they have a base. They'll start finding out who, where these drug users are, where they can go more, where other places they can go. Yeah. And it's and so why am I saying that? Let's get quickly. Because straight away, is your young person involved in the hot spotting? Sometimes we think, yes, this may be done by the, the employer, the main drug dealer, but sometimes what we need to start to start to see is okay, what is our young person actually doing? Why when now maybe your young person who's climbed up the ranks and now they're starting to set up county lines and operations, maybe they're going to be the ones to hang outside of the post office waiting for them to get their universal credit so they can be telling them, all right, yeah, go down the corner and get your drugs. Yeah. So it's like that. What is county lines and how does it actually look like? So that's the county town. <coughs> Apologies. That's the county town. And essentially, quickly moving into component number two is the county line phone. Now, this doesn't look like my iPhone that was just ringing a second ago. It doesn't. Looks, what do we call those phones again? Someone let me know in the chat. It always escapes my mind. What do we call those phones? It looks like a burner. Burn. That's it. A burner phone. Uh, Alcatel, a Nokia. Yeah. It's one of those trap phones. It's a tech. It's a tizzy. Yeah. Definitely. It's a burner phone. All of those slang terms. A tech. A tizzy, write this down. It's called a tech. It's called a tizzy, Nokia 3310, or the Samsung, yeah, or the Alcatel, yeah. It's a disposable phone. You can get it for like five to 25 pounds in the shop. What's a young person doing with that phone, a brick phone? Are they playing the game Snake that some of us used to play when we were younger? I, 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 I doubt it, yeah. A young person today, I say it all the time, if a young person has this phone today, it's one of our hugest signs and indicators. If they have this phone today, they're either selling drugs or they're impersonating a drug dealer. Because a lot of them try to do that. Yeah, they'll be flicking it in classroom, trying to impress the girls. But yeah, these are the phones we're talking about. Why do they want this phone? Because they've been told that if you get chased, you're getting chased by the police, throw that phone away. You can duplicate the SIM card very easily. Yeah, why do they want the phone? Because they think that it isn't, it isn't traceable. It is. It is. But they think that. That's the taboo. Side note, big side note now, if you're taking notes, in 2022, as I said, we're maturing, drug dealers now are using iPhones. They are. They are. They're making drug sales through WhatsApp messaging. Why? Because it's an encrypted app. 
So smarter drug dealers are starting to use iPhone. It makes our job difficult because they know that I'm out here telling people the truth. <laughs> but essentially, now the iPhone now is being used. It's less suspicious. However, nine times out of ten, we are still seeing the drug runners, those on the field, still having this type of phone. That phone would ring and ring and ring. I remember that that Ericsson, Ericsson ringtone that would wake me up at 5 a.m. in the morning from a nap drug user wanting wanting more drugs you know anytime i hear that sound it just sends me back that phone would ring every five minutes ten minutes and it will be one of the drug users asking for something maybe anything from 10 pounds worth of drugs all the way to 200 pounds worth of drugs and that's when we start to get our turnover of a thousand to a three thousand pounds a day yeah that's just one line yeah and that would ring that phone would ring and now essentially now when that is ringing to that capacity, that drug dealer doesn't want to be walking around the streets of Oxford selling drugs in broad daylight with the sun shining on him like this. No, they don't want that. So what are they going to do? They need to conceal themselves. Just put a one in the chat if you've heard of the term cuckoo property or the process of cuckooing. Just put a one in the chat. Yep, a cuckoo. Yep, so perfect. We all know where it is. Essentially, we're talking about a household that has been um, taken over by a gang. It's called cuckoo. It's called cuckooing because it's the analogy of a bird taking over a bird's nest. We know where it is, and this is also what for for a young person we're not calling it a cuckoo. What are we calling it? A trap house, a bando, a tea house, the nitty yard, the crack house. That's what we're calling it. Why? And if we all know what cuckoo is, for everyone that's put one in the chat, we know that out of this whole system, with all the trauma and with all the all, all the all the row and the risks and all the fear that takes place in this reality of county lines, nine times out of ten, it's in that cuckoo property. Yeah, this is the household where the young person is going to be. So when we got to component number three, this drug dealer that has walked around the streets of Oxford, built his um, clientele by giving out these samples, sets up his company phone and now is giving out. Now he has contacts ringing him every five, ten minutes. This is when he or she no longer wants to be in Oxford. Now it's their job now to bring a proposal to one of the drug users they're selling to. They're going to be like, yo, mate. Instead of you buying all these drugs of me, let me stay in your house. Yeah, I'll give you five wraps a day. That's 50 pounds worth of drugs. They will give that young, they will, they will give that vulnerable adult, that drug user, a, um, a, a an offer. And now they will use that house as rent. Yeah, I remember when as a young person, when I was told to, when I was told, to, when I was in my first cuckoo property at 16, I remember being in that house and I was told every, every quarter of the day, give them another wrap. 12 o'clock, here's one wrap. Three o'clock, here's another wrap. Six o'clock, here's another wrap. Nine o'clock, every uh, every quarter, every every year, three hours, sorry, you're telling them to give them another wrap. And that essentially was their rent. That was their rent. Or maybe you'll do it a bit more, uh, just you'll give them five a day. I was told never give them five straight away because they will take all of that five and in three hours, they'll be demanding that you give them more, you get out of the house. And then essentially they do this over time. And then maybe if you are more authority in the, uh, in, in, in the operation, then eventually what you'll do is you will, will give these drug users more than they often than than, than they do. And then essentially now they end up owing you drugs. And then the, the main boss, the main employer, S, will turn back at that drug user and say, you owe me so and so much money. You either let us stay in this house for free or you got to pay it back. And now that house has been officially cocooned. Hope that makes sense. Do you, you mind? Yeah, of course, Elizabeth. Sorry, I'm talking fast. Um, so the other words for other names for cuckoo property is a trap house, is a bando. Yeah, is a bando, trap house, tea house, a crack house, the nitties, the nitties yard or the, 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 the crackheads yard. That's where they're going to their house. It belongs to the drug user's house. A tea house, a bando is taken from the term an abandoned house, because in a bandos in America, in a, in America it's a bit different. You go to the Bronx, you see bandos. It's houses that have been abandoned. No one lives there, and these gangs will go into these houses, and it's no one lives there, and they will use that as the crack house. Yeah, and it's in the cuckoo property. Right, listen now, in it's in the cuckoo property. These drugs are manufactured, stored, and distributed. Maybe not all three, but that's what can take place. A real trap house, you you will see the drugs being manufactured there, from being cooked there, 
to being wrapped in packages there, to them being stored there, to being sold there. I can give you so many different scenarios of how this looks. I've been in houses where one house was used just to store the drugs and then no one would stay there. You would just have it there. You would check on it. And then in another house, that's where you would actually be. And in this house, this is, this is, it, 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 it did, like in my situation, one house was, we stored the drugs there because it was not, it was more on a quiet street. It was, it was tidy. It looked like a normal house to the, to the naked eye. No one knew what was going on in that house. But then in another house, just down the street was a real crack house. Everyone knew where that the, where the, uh, knew what was going on in that house. That was the house that's been kicked down by the police, and we would put the young people there. And it's almost like insanity that a young person would stay there overnight because any day the police could just run into that house. I've sat in crack houses where there's parties going on. People are coming, like thirty drug users, all going getting high off the, the the getting high off the drugs, and you're told to sit there because why they want you to sell to all of these individuals. We're talking about the cuckoo property this house belongs to a vulnerable adult this could be someone that wrestles with mental health someone that has been enticed by love and romance this is not it's not only the drug user nine times out of ten it is the drug user however i've been in cuckoo properties where it's a vulnerable adult it's an elderly person they've been forced so let's not just expo let's not just ignore that yeah, it could be someone that is an elderly person, someone that's being manipulated, someone that's been forced. I've had a story. I have a. I have, we've had a caseload where a, a, a like a, a elderly man, a sixty year old, was being exploited by his grandson. Yeah, his grandson was using the house, and the 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 granddad was being abused. He didn't. He couldn't call no one. He was being threatened. Yeah. So there's so many different cases of how this looks like, especially in 2022. Even now, Oxford, where's Oxford? It's a university area. A lot of the time when we're seeing in different campuses areas, we're seeing like areas like Portsmouth, Southampton. A lot of uh, students' houses are being cuckooed. And the drug dealers are impersonating themselves as student. Give me your student ID when I'm driving about in a car. They're walking around with their ID acting like they're students. No, they're drug dealers. They're selling drugs. Yeah. And how do we start to look at how do we start to see that this is where the signs and indicators, the behaviors, you know, um, that needs to start to really be looked at deeply so we can start to identify how we can identify who's really involved and who's not. Ah, the cuckoo property. Yeah, that's that's where every when I say that's where nine out of ten, um, I'm a community learning discipline and happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. There's a wide range of things. Of course, don't get me wrong. The ideal person or people that the gang wants to target is the drug user. Why? Because they're the ones that's going to bring in more customers. However, in many cases, there is range of different vulnerable individuals that have been targeted. Um, just moving on, um, the drug, the Kiku property, why it's so... Um, yeah, so the cuckoo property is the house that's going to be raided by three different people, if you're writing things down. It will be raided by the police. It will be raided by drug users. Because when the drug users... <laughs> drug users, uh, it's uh, it's ignorant to think every, uh, drug users are just frail and, and vulnerable and weak. And there's some big, strong, mafia-looking drug users, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> like it's not always a like like they will raid the house where they'll come with their machetes and troops i can tell you stories um and then of course it will be raided by gangs rival gangs other competition and this is when we see a turf war take place so with all of these descriptions that i've just broken down to um it's important that we know that s our drug dealer for our example isn't in the house who's in the house guys someone shout it at me who is actually in the house s no s isn't there where's s gone away s is where's s he's away where is he he's in benny hey, harder's hi. he's in a restaurant a fly restaurant he he's with his girlfriend or his or their boyfriend it's going to be the young kid inside that cuckoo property right s is going to be back in london yeah, with a phone in his hand, gone to Dubai, <clears throat> talk about it, just making sure he's talking to that young person every single hour saying, yo, how much has been made? 
Yeah. S S probably won't even be the one telling the young person to go sell the drugs. He will have a supervisor. Yeah. I'll tell you my story in a moment where essentially my main employer, I only spoke to him three times. But there was a supervisor who I thought was my boss. He wasn't my boss. He was just the person doing the, the more overseeing. Yeah. So now essentially we're looking at a system now where S is far removed from this dangerous place called the Cuckoo property, the trap house. Yeah. And essentially um, this has taken us to component number four, the young person. This is what is why we're here today. CCE, child criminal exploitation a child under the age of 18 has been manipulated coerced or forced into staying in that cuckoo property that young person has a target on their back that target represents all of the risks the trauma the the the, the violence that can take place and this young person is unaware of and in the second half of the session this is what we're going to be focusing on all to do with this young person yeah, but it's important that we just really see the perspective as a whole because the young person is not even the main, he's just he or she is the fourth, just the fourth component. That young person would have been recruited from London originally, but now that young person may also be from Oxford. It could be either or. Yeah, so now this young person would now be given a wage. Uh, for whatever reason, we're going to look at for the second in the second half, but this young person, uh, a post. Uh, following them, their acceptance of joining the operation, this young person will be given a wage. The average wage a young person is paid now is £100 a day. Yeah, £100 a day. That's £700 a week, £2,800 a month. This is what a young person is being paid. And essentially, this young person would be the one that stays in that house. Yeah. At 16, I got into a I was I had a really bad relationship with my dad. It was violent, abusive. And I ran away from home at the age of 16. And when I ran away from home, I found solace with my gang. And my gang gave me an opportunity to go county lines. My first opportunity, my first um, experience was in an area called uh, Margate in Kent. And I went into Margate at age 16 and I stayed in a flat. I remember it going up the stairs and I remember being at the top floor. That was our cuckoo property. And I remember it was belonged to um, the, 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 the users, the, the individuals, the occupants of that house were a Caucasian couple, male and female, female. Yeah. And I remember being in that house and I had to stay there for three weeks. And essentially it was my responsibility to, to, to distribute these drugs. Yeah. In my in my case, I was the one that would have to take the drugs. I would have a package. And essentially, if you're writing things down, you may give a young person. So for me, I had two G packs. I called I had something called a G pack. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, a G pack is essentially a package of drugs that is worth one thousand pounds. G stands for a grand. So I was given a G pack. It's a slang term. Watch out for young people talking that talk like, yeah, I got yeah, G pack packs and all of that. So you you may you may have you may have two G packs, and essentially you'll have a grand worth of crack cocaine and a grand's worth of heroin. What's that in total? Two thousand pounds. So I was sent to Margate with two thousand pounds worth of drugs. Guys, with no exaggeration, that would go in a day and a half. So now, me as a 16-year-old child, I'm now going back and forth outside of that block of flats where the alleyway is opposite the block of flats. There's an alleyway that I've been told every single time that phone rings, like you just heard a ringtone now, that phone rings, I have to take the amount of drugs I've been told on the phone, whether that's three on three, four on four, 80 pound, 120, to take those drugs and put it in my mouth, underneath my tongue, go down the block of flats, go into that alleyway, take the drugs out, give it to that drug user, collect the cash and go straight back upstairs into that ripped up couch where I sat on for three weeks, yeah? And it's in that house that I would have to wait. What happens after a day and a half? Does that mean I have to get, I get to go home? Absolutely not. What would happen after a day and a half? My supervisor would call me, find out there's no more drugs left and he will send either himself or he will send a young person to come and replenish me with more drugs they will give me another two g packs they'll give me another two g packs and collect that two thousand pounds and take it back to london and this would happen every two days like clockwork 
back and forth, back and forth. Why do they do it like that? Because they don't want you to go home. They want to militarise you. They want you to stay in that space. And over after two weeks, that's how it felt. It felt so normal for me to be in that place. You're abandoning your your hygiene. You're not showering. You're not eating. You become militarised. You're called a soldier. I was called Bando Baby. That means I'm a baby. I was born in a trap house. Yeah, I lived there. That was my house. That was my home. At first, it's frightening. And then eventually, you stay there. Was that 24-7? Yes, 100%. So I'm not going home. I'm staying there. So I'm missing for three weeks. And I will talk. I don't think we'll have time. But it, it, um, yeah. So um, where was he? Um, huh. um they replenish so you every two days. They replenish you every two days. Thank you. Um, so they replenish you. So now this is the fifth component, which I was trying to push us through to get through to this final component, which is the transportation. So the transportation process is also a part of the com uh, the process where now a young person is getting on the train, getting on coach, driving up in a car or taxi, and they're coming to replenish the person inside the Cuckoo property with another two G packs or whatever amount of drugs it is. So now, again, when we look at it overall and we sit back now, we look at the five components, maybe your young person isn't the one staying in the trap house. Maybe the ones they're getting on the train. This is also where females get involved, get involved, get involved a lot of the time uh, in the transportation process. Don't get me wrong. Females are involved with every part. But when we look at the transportation process, that's where we start to see a lot of females take lead. They're deemed to be less suspicious, less likely to be stopped and searched. Um, this is where the females will be either driving the car, uh, getting on the train. But essentially, this could happen. This could be a male or female. Yeah. But it generally is a young person as well. This is where we start looking at indicators such as why does your young person have expensive train tickets? You know, where are they going? We have to look at those elements. Yeah. So that that fourth and the fifth is where our young people are really starting to take. We're starting to see their activity now. They're going to be in the house. They're going to be in the flats. They're going to be on the train. They're going to be in the cars. Yeah. Also, when we think about plugging, it's a term plugging or banking or banking. Essentially, this is the process of hiding the drugs. It's almost instantly expected for a young person to bank or plug the drugs. And this essentially is when you hide the drugs internally, whether in your anal passage or in your genital area, depending on your gender. So this is this is expected for a young person that is traveling from that is traveling on the train. You can't put those drugs in your bag. What are you doing putting that in your putting that in your pocket, in your coat? You can't do that. What if the police see it? And then through that language and through that pushing, now you see young people that are very much ready to just um, hide that parcel internally. Yeah. And and th this is where the conversation has come come up with professionals in whether that should be deemed CSE which is child sexual exploitation. Of course, there's an argument between it should be deemed, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm for it being deemed a sexual exploitation. But of course, if sexual, exploit, uh, if sexual intent uh, cannot be proved, currently it can't be deemed as a sexual, ex it can't be deemed a sexual exploitation. But then you start to see, um, you start to see the, this overlap start to, cre um, start to form um, with what is just crime to now ending up being, uh, what being criminal, um, selling drugs and now being abused sexually. So, um, yeah, guys, I'm mindful. I feel like I've been chatting at you guys, like boom, 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 boom. But hopefully, you guys have notes and you have perspective. So, yes, please, if anyone wants to share, uh, Alice. Hi, hi, um, hi, Alice. I was just gonna say, um, there was some other uh training that was police sort of um reporting sexual assaults and sexual violence and so on and she spoke about um spooning which happens in prison which is retrieving obviously drug packages from somebody else's anal package without consent and so on yes and she was yes. saying that that's actually on the form so that's that's technically because it's so traumatic for the for the victim um that's actually included on their form now so it yeah. seems kind of relatable to what you're saying with the yeah. yeah absolutely thank you for raising that and yes that wouldn't only just happen in prison that would happen in the cuckoo property essentially with rival gangs because there is a there is a strong 
CSE overlap, not maybe through plugging and banking, but essentially now with rival gangs and conflict. So very um, real cases have happened where rival gangs have come into the Kuku property and they've been instructed by their employers by any means necessary, make sure you take those drugs and you get the information on so and so. And essentially that would look like uh, essentially spooning or even cases where um, because you, your foot, you, I, as a young person that is loyal to my gang, I'm responsible for those drugs. So I've been told to not give it up for no, in no case. So in this situation now, now it becomes very difficult on both ends because this gang now want to force this young person. And in some cases, they may be more scared of their employer than this gang. And this is where unfortunate cases have taken place, like you, um, like you pay, you, like paying drug users or who tend to be sex workers to perform certain acts on a young person if they don't give up the information that's been asked. Um, so you can you can imagine that, um, or even cases where you're just kidnapping this young person and like you're forced, you're just yeah, you're you, you all sorts of uh, illicit. Um, actions um some sexual um if they don't give up information so this has happened um csc is everywhere in this cuckoo property even down to just in terms of our young people like just guys there's gen like sometimes we'll think think just imagine three 15 year olds in a trap house one of them's a female two boys they've been there for a week and they're up at 5 a.m all living on all sharing a sofa yeah and then it's just that that honestly i see it as spiritual like the way this household is the way the behavior and the way the nature is treated it's animalistic you're no longer act you're no longer being promote you're not promoting normal well-being you're just you see yourself as a soldier you got to do things on call so a lot of these elements can start to provoke on very on um very, very vile thoughts and uh, inappropriate behavior it's happened so um, a lot of CSC overlaps um, exist, um, you know, yeah, yeah, a lot of things can, yeah, fellow, so thank you for raising that, Alice. Does anyone else have any questions, thoughts on the process, things that they want to ask or raise or highlight? Because I know you guys have done a bit of training around exploitation. Just feel free to raise your hands. Has this been helpful so far, guys? For, yeah, so put a one in the chat if you think this has been helpful. We're about to go into our break, so amazing stuff. Um, yeah, amazing stuff. Um, so as I mentioned, um, yeah, as I mentioned, um, do, 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 how should I do this because of time? Yeah, actually, yeah, I'll hold it. I'll tell you, okay, cool. Yeah, cool. Let's all right, everyone's happy. All right, let's take a comfort break, um, because it's been a lot. Um, and then we're going to dive straight into grooming. We're going to look at the grooming line and how young people now are being exploited into this reality. So we're going to spend the remaining session looking at component number four, this young man or young lady. Um, this individual um, this individual um, that we see um, on the screen, um, we're going to look at his story. His name is Nathan. Um, we have animated his story into a short film. It's only going to be like seven minutes long. So we're going to start the second half by watching Nathan's story and how he actually got exploited into County Lines. So look forward to that. It's 3.15 now. If we could come back at 3, 3.10, it's 3.10 now. If we come back at 3.15, give us five minutes just to quickly get a hot drink, um, coffee, toilet break and so forth. So stop sharing your screens. Come back with new energy, guys. Thank you so far for listening. All right, five minutes.
Hey all, welcome back. I'm just loading up the video, so we'll start again in a minute or two. Thanks. Really okay, welcome back all. Welcome back. Hopefully you had a refreshing uh, five minutes. Um, I'm going to just share Nathan's story now and then from that we're going to just open up into a quick discussion of what we thought about the video. Just signs. Um, um, just thoughts of what stood out to us. Um, so, yeah, it will be great to hear what you guys think of the video and um, we're just going to use it as like a quick conversation. So, yeah, I'm going to share it now. Fingers crossed it works straight away. Just let me know if everyone is, is back. Just put one in the chat if you're back. Let me know, let me know. I'm going to start sharing in a moment. Fingers crossed it always gives me a headache on Teams. But if you guys could just confirm with me, you can see this. That would be great. Let me Country. Punch. Did you not hear that? Yeah. Yeah, it's fine, man. Oh, you saw it? Oh, great. Oh, perfect. I got scared. All right, cool. Country. Conch. OT. Out there. Out of town. Upsa going oh there's loads of names for it the government and professionals refer to it as county lands county lands is a term used to describe gangs and criminal networks involved in exporting drugs mostly class a from major cities to countryside or seaside towns setting up drug operations in the counties they're likely to exploit children and vulnerable adults to move and store the drugs everything's controlled by the gang that has the trap phone and you stay there until you finish moving the pack of drugs you've been given to sell. Back then, if you asked me why I got involved, I would have said simply to make money. But now I look back on it, it was deeper than just the money. When I really deep it, I was searching for belonging. Like everyone else, I wanted to fit in. I know it sounds soft, but I wanted to be loved. I wanted brothers, big brothers that had my back. I wanted respect. I was sick of being a nobody. Sick of people getting onto me for wearing dead clothes, having beat down trainers no drip no ratings so them times i used to think money would have solved all those problems home was a place i didn't want to be nowhere near every day there was problems at school i didn't feel like i could speak to anyone about all the issues i was facing at home instead i expressed my emotions by being mad disruptive and getting kicked out all the time one time me and my boy kai were bunking off from school and decided to chill outside the estate. Kai's older brother Slim pulled up in his new car shouting at Kai through the car window, telling him to go back to school immediately. But Slim told me to wait behind and jump in the passenger seat as he wanted to talk to me about something. I was gassed that Slim even noticed me. Everyone rated Slim. He had everything I didn't. Ratings, clout, money, cars, designer clothes, everything. All the guys wanted to be like him and all the girls wanted to be with him. He told me that he saw me as his little brother and that I reminded him a lot of himself when he was young. He started checking up on me all the time and started calling me his protege. I played it cool, but I don't think you understand how gassed this got me. I started bunking school more and spending more time around Slim and the Olders. That's when he told me about going country to work for him and that he'll pay me a hundred pound a day. The next day, Slim took me to the trap house. The trap house is where the drugs are sold, kept, manufactured, misused by addicts and where the workers stay. It usually belongs to a drug user who doesn't prioritise hygiene or paying the bills because they're too busy feeding their habit. So the living conditions are horrible. Stepping into the trap house was like stepping into a nightmare. The smell was indescribable. It burnt my nostrils and made my eyes water. It was dark and dingy, there was no running water and there was used syringes all over the floor. Is this where I'm meant to be staying? I asked Slim why the front room had no sofa, no PS, Xbox, not even a TV. He told me I wouldn't need any of that and handed me over a disposable phone and two packages. One was crack cocaine and the other one was heroin. He told me that I had to answer the phone every time it rang and if it didn't, we would all be losing out on money. 
The phone rang every two minutes. Each phone call being a request for drugs. Slim would come every time I ran out of drugs to collect the money and replenish the drugs. If the money was short or if I made mistakes, I see a totally different side of him. People think trapping is fun or easy. I never worked so hard in my life. Sometimes I was working up to 48 hours straight, no sleep. I didn't eat properly. I didn't shower because there was no running water. My skin began to deteriorate and I missed my family. I know my mum was probably sick. I witnessed stuff I wouldn't even wish on my worst enemies. And I know bare youths that experienced the same, if not worse. Michael was one of many that got stabbed up and seriously injured. I still think about what happened to that drug user Ginger to this day. And Jade. You don't even want to know what happened to Jade. I told myself, this is just part of the process and soon I'll be my own boss like Slim. When I look back at it, I feel stupid. I get £100 a day and that wasn't even always guaranteed. And don't get it twisted, that day wasn't an eight hour shift with a lunch break in between. I'd work 24 hours straight, non-stop making sales. Actually deep it, 100 divided by 24 rounds up to something like uh, £4 an hour. That's below minimum wage. I was getting bumped and I didn't even realise. I knew year 11s and 6 formers that worked weekend jobs and made more than that legitly. It all ended when we got robbed by a rival gang at gunpoint. Slim went ballistic when he found out. He said we all owed him for the drugs and money we lost and had to work for free to pay off the debt. I wanted to run, but I knew Slim would target my family, so I carried on working. In the end, Slim went to prison for a very long time. I haven't seen him since. I later found out that it was Slim's people that robbed us and he was the one that set it all up to put us in debt and use us as free labour. Even though Slim called me his little bro, he never got his actual little brother Kai involved. He always told Kai to stay in school because he cared about him and wanted him to have a bright future. But I was just disposable and replaceable to him. He made me believe I was his little brother so he could use me. Slim groomed me. Grooming is when someone befriends or builds an emotional connection with a person in order to manipulate, exploit and abuse them. If I was educated on this process and how to spot the signs of it happening, maybe I wouldn't have allowed it to happen to me. I picked up some bad habits and the lifestyle of a county lines drug runner became normal. But what really made me change was when I found people I could trust. Back then, if I built up the courage to tell my mum or only if I trusted a teacher enough to tell them what was going on, I know they could have helped me. Also, I wasted so much time going country to sell drugs that it held me back from my personal goals and ambitions, as well as bring pain and discomfort to my loved ones. If I made decisions with that in mind, I would have never got involved because it took me further away from reaching my true potential. You might think of County Lines as something that's cool because it's sugar-coated in glitz and glamour on music videos. People you know might brag about it when you see the temporary highlights on Snap and Insta or other socials. But now you've heard it from someone that's been through it firsthand, and it almost killed me. But that's for another time. Amazing stuff, amazing stuff. Probably if you guys found that helpful. How did you guys, very thought provoking, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So that is just one of our, uh, one of our pieces that we use. Um, it's, I've just been told that it's nearly finished, finished this contract. I think it's with Kent, um, where we had to create a, a few content pieces with their students during COVID last year. Um, would you like to, yes, um, where we were essentially, we were, yeah, essentially, there's a, a a a range of different resources that we we were offering the kids as a study pack, where we looked at the life of each of those, of which few of the main characters. So that was the life of Nathan, um, and then they they get asked a few questions about how did they think Nathan felt and so forth. But then there's also Ginger, which was the drug user, um, and also Slim, who was the exploiter, the main perpetrator involved. Um, but yeah, did anyone, what stood out to you guys? Um, what was a highlight for you? What caught your attention, made, provoked a thought in your mind? Anyone want to go? We just raise a hand, it'll be good to hear a few people. 
Mm -mm -mm. Not all at once. Uh, is, that, uh, is that Alice? Hey, Alice. Um, um, yeah, hi. Um, I just think it's like, that's why I asked, you know, in the chat, is it 24 seven? Because I was thinking, surely, like if you break that down by pa pa pay per hour, you yeah. know, but it's yeah. that, you, that kids are just gaslit, aren't they, into thinking that this is an amazing situation. And when you actually break it down, you think it's really a shame, isn't it? It's not it, actually a lot of money, is it? Yeah. Um. So, yeah, per hour. And, you know, you don't, like you say, you don't get breaks, you don't get no health and safety. You get the opposite. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So £4.16 per hour, no lunch breaks, no seeing your mum at the end of your shift. And guess what? If you make a mistake during that hour shift, you you have to pay that back. It's not like a Sainsbury's job. You drop the eggs down the aisle, they're not going to take that out of your wage. But anything that goes wrong in the, in, in the cuckoo property essentially is on you. So, yeah, that is a talking point at schools. I'm like, raise your hand. Who wants £100 a day? Everyone goes crazy. Ah, I want £100. I was like, what would you do for that £100? You haven't even asked me that. What do you have to do for it? And then we even break down of how long you're working. It's not a lot of work. It's not a lot of money. And then I've seen the penny drop for a few for a few kids when we talk about that. Um, Kay? Kay, you had your hands up? I think okay? Oh, Kerry, Kerry. I called you Kay like we're best friends. Hey, Kay. It's all right. Um, I think what stands out, and I think what always stands out for me and probably for other people is just how disposable other people's lives are and how disposable children's lives are. Um, and I just I just find that um, I feel like everybody else um, frustrating and upsetting and it makes you quite angry. Mm, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. And I feel like this is a job where we need to be angry. I feel like emotions. Um, I say to, I was saying to the police officers in a session, I was like, it's not about what you say to these kids. It's how you make them feel. And you it's like I can go into a room and. I tell them, I want, I, I say it every time I'm in a session, even with you guys, by the end of it, even though I know some of it's heavy, I want us to look at these young kids differently. We have to look at them because our eyes tell a story. They have an element of care. Just the way we see them and the care that it gives them. You know, I've been in places where I didn't think the social worker that was working on my case didn't, I don't think you like me. I don't really feel you care about me. I don't think you really know what I'm going through. And that was a that was a gap because it's like, how can we show these kids that we do see them and we know what they're going through? They really need to understand that. So, yeah, thank you for raising that, Kerry. Um, Michelle. Hi, um, I was just going to say about the power of belonging as mm. part of the grooming process. And then I kind of really felt the loss when he realised that actually they didn't care about him. Mm, mm, mm. And how and we saw, um, we we can see like from the moment that um, Nathan and his friend left school, they were bunking. They were bunking school and Slim was actually the brother of his friend. And we see that Slim never even ever got his little brother involved. However, there was this still clinging a need for um, for for Nathan to get involved. And he was like, he felt like my big brother, you know, but it's almost there like. How like we always I'm always saying that to the young people like I would have never got my young brother involved. So this element of love and care, how how do you let how do you measure if someone actually cares about you? If they actually have loved ones, ask them, would they get their little brother involved? Did they get their little sister involved? Of course not. Um, which is also enough. Uh, yeah, it's really important that we highlight that. Um, and almost as soon as that got ripped away, then we see. Nathan, which we we haven't even began to even discuss where how does where where does that leave him now with the distrust that he will have for these types of individuals um, and in any type of authority that being so yeah important. Can you want to add? Yeah. I'm sorry, I was just sorry. Saying, no, like, go on, carry on, carry on. Like, I kind of work in cams, um, yeah. and the number of children that we see that would fit that profile of wanting to belong is really quite scary. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So when we go into a second now, into our our grooming line, we're going to look at that element of belonging. And essentially, if that is a need, if that is a vulnerability, who is providing that for our young people? Absolutely. A uh, few more comments. Um, Kerry, you want to go and then uh, Alice will round it up. I'm ever so sorry. I didn't realise my hand was still up. Apologies. Oh, no worries. <laughs> You're just waving it in the air like you just don't care. Amazing. Uh, Alice, are you, is your hand up intentionally? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, first. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I did two years in CAMS. Did two years in CAMS. I worked in CAMS for two years. Um, and it's almost like you, you can get you get the vulnerability from the, the, the fact that teenagers and adolescents obviously haven't got the lived experience and so on but then you get the double vulnerability when people have got you know past trauma or difficult upbringings and you know lacking in sort of social groups and things and I I, I was shocked as well about the amount of kids that were coming through and it was just on their on their information um you know because a lot of it I found was concentrating more on child sex exploitation rather than the criminal side of it and things and we get females come in and the CSE risk would be all over CSE risk CSE risk but then males would come out through and yeah. you would hear them talking about potentially being involved in gangs but there'd be no no sort of like process followed it just yeah. felt yeah. really unusual yeah, definitely. Thank you for and it's yeah, it's huge. Solution wise, we always talk about the signposting process, and we always thinking about this multi agency approach. If we're seeing an agency who has the profile knowledge of this young person, and there's a, you know, there's a, a risk assessment perhaps that's been done, and you're assessing this young person, and they're saying, "I've been involved in this. I have these urges, feelings. I'm smoking. I don't have money to have, what." All of that is, is 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 these huge factors that essentially the perpetrator hasn't looked and turned away from. They've seen that and they said, whatever I've just seen this young person say, I'm going to approach that right now. You smoke weed. I'm going to give you all the weed you want. I'm going to teach you how to roll a spliff yourself. You know, you want money. Like, they're going to say that. And it's like, it's right in front of us. And we see the 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 red tape that makes it difficult for a particular type of professional to step in further than their work allows. But this is why we need that multi-agency. It's about knowing because there is services across the, uh, the board that can support that young person in particular areas of their vulnerability. And maybe it's a mental because that plays a holistic role. But again, yeah, that's we're seeing it. We're seeing it and yeah. Yeah, so I, I came I came into this line of work like almost hands up, like what's everyone doing? What's wrong with you lot? Like there, but now when but the more I work with more professionals and as a mentor, and I'm like, wow, this is actually difficult in this space, and this is partly why I'm not even my mo my main work doesn't happen in with this lanyard on, nah, like my it's like. Like I'm a I'm a social figure. I, I'm a musician by trade. I have to make sure people know that they can see me and connect with me and, and see my life because it isn't just when they come on. And that's difficult when we think about the um the order um the order of things, but essentially that's how we get deeply connected with some of these individuals. I think it's when they know we it's not just the work or a job or whatever. We need to actually take that uniform off, take that lanyard off and meet them where they are. And I think St Giles works very well with that because it is a voluntary uh, service. Um, but yeah, um, we digress a little. Um, wow, time doesn't like me. But as long as you guys are enjoying, um, then I'm happy. However, there's a lot that I want to share with you, so I'm going to prioritise now. Um, just look at this statement on the screen very quickly. Um, this sums up um, the mindset of a drug dealer. They say that all I care about is money. These youngers, these young people are vulnerable, disposable and replaceable. We've just been discussing just now for the past few minutes and looking at Nathan's story through the animation, vulnerabilities. We've just seen how, what made Nathan vulnerable and even in this 
most recent uh, back and forth uh, when you raised Alice in terms of we're seeing this on the profile. We see that kids are vulnerable, but the problem is there's this um, approach where they 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 this disposable and uh, replaceable nature is also being applied uh, to our young people. They they are they are grooming kids because this is how they see themselves. Like their gr- their vulnerability is one thing, but now they're saying I've had, I ask kids all the time, this is what they think about you. Are you actually replaceable? Are you actually disposable? No, of course I'm not replaced because there's only one of you. And the point is, and you even I in the kids will be silly all the time when I'm in schools, and you will see so many of them say, Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. And the point is, what are we to, what are we trying to do when we're signposting? We're trying to restore the value or the perspective of value that young kids should have for themselves. They're more worth a hundred pounds a day. They're more worth. They, they have so much more worth than being in a trap house and risking their life, risking their freedom, risking their sanity. Yeah. So through it, but so when we go into the grooming line now, I take that in mind because when it's the line of work I do is is all about how can I restore this this perspective that they what has what has or, or what if for instance what has snatched this perspective from them what has been what has happened that this young person sees themselves um in this light that anyone can like exploit it um because that plays a part um but yeah let's get into it oh i just realized the animation was here as well that's helpful um but yeah let's get into it so grooming very quickly oh my god i don't have a lot of time so very quickly just looking at the grooming line there's four stages i'm sure you guys have seen this before it's a uh, it's a uh, it's the grooming line which was inspired from the charity bernardos um but which is around cscs so this describes how a young person may be groomed sexually but it, it, it applies across the board it's the same case whether it's criminal exploitation sexual exploitation uh, whether it's um extremism it works throughout we're seeing that young people are targeted, a friendship forms, a lover relationship is built, and then abuse takes place. Abuse can't take place without those three things taking that early shift for it to, if that early for taking stage first. Yeah, so we're seeing that young people are being targeted. How did Nate, very quickly looking at Nathan, we saw he was targeted where? So um, he was targeted outside of school because he was bunking. Yeah. So the targeting stage, I'm going to say this very quickly, is the selection process of your selecting young people due to their vulnerabilities. We're not just the perpetrator isn't just going around picking kids on random. No, they're selecting kids that are vulnerable. They're seeing kids that have a vulnerability. And and sometimes that's not always clear. But from their skill set, their engagement techniques, they're starting to see the kids that are vulnerable and then they want to target them and start to build friendships with them. So for Nathan, you're bunking school. You're already vulnerable. Why are you bunking school? You have a you don't respect education. You don't want to you don't want to go to school. That's already a conversational star targeted. Now the conversation built, he starts to know. He's seeing the way he looks at Slim is seeing the way Nathan looks at him. His eyes bulging. We saw how he was looking at the social media status. They were glamorized by this individual. Get in my car already. All of this is going to be affirming the perpetrator to say, yep, I got what this kid needs. They want social uh, so- social currency. They want respect. They want power. They want belonging. And with all of this said and done, friendship forming is all about providing the needs of that vulnerable young person. This is the this is the. This is the magic. This is the transition. This is what where we have failed to protect our young people because young people are being provided for by the wrong people. How does this look like in a holistic form? My favourite slide in this whole presentation, the conditions of the heart. Yeah. Young people are being exploited. Uh, they, they have different vulnerabilities. It's not just money. It's not just belonging. Sometimes it's because they're being bullied. Sometimes it's adverse childhood. Maybe they don't have a father figure, a mother figure. Maybe it's because they're bored. Boredom. We're seeing these, we're seeing these kids in um, private schools. They have all the, they have parents, but their parents are rich in cash, but they're poor in time. And essentially, these kids are still liable to be groomed because they're bored. They have nothing to do. They don't have excitement in their life. We saw the numbers of kids going, getting involved in county lines go up during the COVID-19 crisis. When the schools closed, we saw more kids getting involved in, in county lines. Why? Because they were at home. They had nothing to do. What are we giving for our kids to do? I digress. But essentially, for Nathan, his vulnerabilities was that belonging. 
his vulnerabilities was that issue. And what's going to happen? Friendship Foreman's going to be like, I'm going to give it to you. Yeah. And why I love this uh, uh, infographic so, so much is because it shows you all the vulnerabilities, then it shows you the missing piece. And this is what these perpetrators have done that us professionals need to be doing, providing a missing piece. Whatever you're going through, I'll give it to you. Yeah, what team do you support? Arsenal, I'm buying you that top tomorrow. I did that for you. Who taught me how to drive? Not my dad, my gang. Who taught me how to feel strong about myself? Who gave me identity, character? Who made me feel confident? Who told me, yo, yeah, when I'm nervous? He said, no, here's the opportunity. Speak to that person. Feel confident about yourself. It wasn't my dad. It was my gang. And all of these things, my missing piece. I had a missing piece in terms of my father figure in my life. I hated my dad. He was abusive. He was violent. He was aggressive towards me and my older brothers. And because of that, I had a bad relationship with authority. Anyone that represented authority, anyone that was domineering like my dad, anyone that was authoritative like my dad, the police officers, the male teachers, the social workers in my life, anyone that came like they thought they could tell me what to do and if I didn't do what they do, I was going to get in trouble, I hated them. And because of that, I didn't gravitate to any authority and it made me disruptive, it made me act, speak out of turn, it made me get in trouble, it made me get kicked out of school and go to a prune year seven and all of these things when I did, who then came and saw me? Who rubbed my back? Who hugged me? Who trauma bonded with me and said, Lord, that's a light work. Like, that's all right. But I had a bad dad too. But I, then I said, I'm going to be my own man. What? What lie is that being told to our young people that they can be their own men? A man can't be a man without a man to show them the way. And that all of that was just being mixed into my mindset, my psychology. And by the end of it, I desire to be an authority my own. Yeah. And then when they let me down at 16, when they put me in that situation and groom me and didn't even pay me a dime and I had debt bondage on my name, all of these things that took place there, eventually then I had to find out that I can't even trust them too. What do I do then? No authorities in my life, vulnerable. And at this point of abuse, now I become a perpetrator myself and start following, following suit until 2016. So all of that is being said because that's my story. It doesn't need to just be Nathan. My story, same thing, targeted. How did I get targeted? Because I had these bad relationships with authority. These, these perpetrators are, are psychologists. They're intelligent. They saw that and they said, all right, Luke, why do you never want to go home? I was the kid that never wanted to go home. After school, playing football I, in the park. Oh, we're going home now. Why? And they see how my demeanor changes. I don't want to go home. All right, don't force him. Leave him alone. Chill with me. Engagement at its finest, making me feel loved, making me feel seen. I had these ripped up wallabies in school. I was always scared to ask my dad to buy me new wallaby shoes because I knew that would get him angry. So I didn't. I walked around with my ripped up shoes in school until one of my gang friends saw and then he bought me new shoes. What do you think that does to that young person? They feel loved. They feel I was I was so I felt I love these guys. <laughs> I, they, they were they made me feel strong. They made me feel powerful. I remember my older brothers who also had their daddy issues. I later found out they were involved in the same gang. And then when I found out who my brothers were, by the time I was in year nine, I became this, this walking powerhouse. No one could be rude to me ever again. No one could disrespect me ever again. I felt powerful. I felt strong. Yeah. And I was felt grateful. And that gratitude was the love and relationship component number three. That love and relationship is where deep trust has been formed. And it's because of an exchange. Yeah. And this is what I say. As the grooming line progresses, we are getting what we're, we're losing. It's the grip is looser with these with these young people. How can we grip them back in when they already have a deep love and relationship with these perpetrators? What can you say? What can you do? You just got to love them harder. Who's providing for those needs? Us or the perpetrators? And now it's important because now it's like, yo, I'm going into a school. I've just been told by the SLT that, oh, this person, she's on, um, this, this, this young person, he's on the cusp. And I know I can't just go there like the stranger I am and then begin to tell this young person, yo, what, what are you doing? No, I have to come down on their level. Every time I'm talking to a young person, I sit down and I talk to this young person on a level and I want to know you. I want to know you. People can't DM me on Instagram and say, help me, uh, my son's this. I can't, what, I don't know your son. Get on the phone, know who this person is. And then through there, you're thinking, wow, this is, this is something else. I need time. I need this. And because essentially we're looking at a young person or generation of young people that are already in love and relationships with these people. And it's not, side note, it's not only just face to face. Now it's happening online, social media. People are being groomed and they have deep relationships with these perpetrators online. How? Because Snapchat is the new is the is the, is, is, is the new uh, football parks, the football and basketball courts. 
everyone's talking on Snapchat. They're signposting. I got. Yeah, I can show you examples now of these individuals, perpetrators. They will hide their face. They won't show their face ever with emojis. They will hide their face, but they will show you their hands and all the money they're counting in it. They'll show you the cars and the, the BMW sign with their hand, with the Rolex, and they're driving and they're showing their hands, but they won't show their face. And essentially, young people, they're just glamorized. It's amazing for them to be seeing it. And what do they do? They just click like. Or they, they put fire emojis. And then the perpetrator who's seeing all of these engagements happening online, they're looking through, oh, this person liked my pick. Then they reply back and they say, you like what you see, yeah? Love, bro. Where are you from, by the way? Oh, what? From Kent, Margate? Me too. No, he's not. But he's going to use that as a bargaining tool to start having a conversation. Be like, that's light work. I made that yesterday, bro. Send me your address. I'll send you a, I'll send you a gift. And now they're getting into engagements. And these young people, it's like, just make sure you don't tell no one. And when I've realised, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, even when I realised, oh, like, um, if this young person is not going to say anything because young people all have this no snitch mentality, now I'm going to think, OK, cool, I can trust you. Build that relationship, love and relationship formed. Now you're holding other things for me in, uh, as well. So it's the same thing. I've just given you quickly Nathan's story mixed with my story, mixed with a, a social media story, because these are my learning objectives. I need to make sure we cover that e this is happening different. Females as well. We have females that are targeted through love and romance, boyfriend and girlfriend being introduced. Same thing, getting into relationship. They think these perpetrators are their boyfriends, their lovers, their, the person that l was kind to them, not like their father was kind to them not like the boys in their school was and this person's so romantic taking me on dates no he's trying to build a friendship with you a love and friendship in that case and then it develops into a love and relationship and the same thing happens do me a favor babe hold this for me hold this in the bag that i put gave you and we know it goes on and then abuse is too late abuse is way too late and very quickly these are all the abuses that's going to be in your pack after today these are all the realities and consequences. This is what we need to tell our young people at before the targeting stage. We need to tell them about, all right, you trust this person that is now your big brother or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your mother figure or your father figure, whoever they have now entered in your life to become, they now are going to do, they, they now are going to ask you to do something and this is what it's going to be. And now look at this and make sure that you understand this because I promise you, they're not going to tell you like we're going to tell you. They're going to make it feel like, oh, do me a favour, but they're not going to tell you you have to be up 24 hours a week. So 24 hours a day. They're not going to tell you where you're living. I have a, I know a female in a story, in a case, no time to explain, but essentially when she was dating, they used to go to hotels and she would see the drug, her boyfriend, her drug dealing boyfriend, sell drugs from the hotel until he dropped her to do it for herself and it was in a crack house. And she really thought it was going to be a hotel. No, it wasn't a hotel. That was a trick. So of course it's not a hotel. Do you know what a cuckoo property is? And then we'll see the, the, this young lady that has been signposted to you now, but you, up till now, she might not even understand that was a trap house. That was a drug den. She's just been sent by the school. But when I'm talking to her, I'm like, so do you know what a trap house is? Do you know how that looks? Then you start to describe it to her. And then she's like, I was there. That I was there. She put, they put you there. Do you know what happens there? Then you start to inform and make these people aware. Why? Because the perpetrator, the so-called person they said they love and trust, didn't tell you this. That's where we come in. Let's actually tell them. Let, like, I think knowledge is so powerful. I think when we actually have a chance to tell a young person about the realities of county lines, that's when we can actually have a real rapport with them because they want to know the truth. They want to know the truth. So that's going to be in your power pack, the no sleep, poor living conditions, the CSE overlaps, which you've spoken about already. We're going to talk about prison, criminal, criminal record, debt bondage is a huge one. I say... I say this to everyone, like not even gangs, like gangsters and drug dealers. I say you will know who your friend is when you owe them money. <laughs> you will know who your friend is when you owe them money. Everyone's your friend until you, hey, where's that? Where's that tenner I lent you last year? And then they start moving crazy. Like, whoa, I thought we were friends. Like, I'm going to pay it back. Times 100 for these drug dealers. Yeah, you're my friend. But now you're my little brother. But when you owe me money. Huh. You'll see a different, you'll see their true colours. 
And essentially this happens and it's a huge debt bondage because I know young people, a lot of the time, they know what's happening in county lines now. And the reason they're still involved is because they've been threatened by their employer that if they don't pay back that £2,000 that they lost because they flushed it down on the toilet because they were so tired that they went to the toilet thinking they were just performing their normal toilet routine but forgot that they were unbanking, yeah? There's a rapper that talks about it, says, oh, my young boy flew, uh, flushed the pack down the toilet. How can he be so clumsy? And if, when I say that to the school, everyone's laughing over that bar. But I'm saying, do you know what he's actually saying in that in that rap lyric? He's saying that his young worker woke up, went to the toilet and flushed the pack, that G pack I told you about. They flushed it down the toilet because they were so tired. They took it out and then they must have accidentally just left it in the toilet and just flushed it forgetting that that's not you know and then essentially now th that's how tired they are and now they turn around and like you, the rapper doesn't tell you what happened to that young person that young person's gonna have to pay that money back and now he's in debt bondage where it's modern day slavery you're working for free child labor yeah and then i've seen young people jacob an uh, individual that works for saint Giles trust he was he he lost the drugs at age 17 the gang he was working for he he started he went back to that same house that he knew was being watched by police. He went there because he was desperate, scared that if he did it, um, if he didn't, he was going to get in trouble by his gang. He went there, got caught by the police and went prison. Next four years in prison, life changed. Now he's working for St. Giles Trust. We see these things every day. So we're like, debt bondage is another reality. What do, you, why do, would my young person ever be in debt if I love him and care for him? Would I, would I put my son in debt? Would I put my my little brother in debt? No. And then you saw Slim's story on the animation where he intentionally put Nathan in debt. Didn't we see it? He set him up. That's a new grooming tactic that we're seeing happening. We're setting up our young people to make them think they've made mistakes. They haven't even made the mistakes, but they trust these individuals so much that they think they did. That's the reality we're in right now. So all of these are examples of the abuse. The houses, the prisons, the injuries, the rival gangs, you know, family members being targeted. Yeah. All of these are examples. We have rival gangs we've spoken about. All of these family members being targeted because remember, they know where you live. So all of these are going to push this young person. And why I'm saying these, even though they deserve much more time, is these are the conversations Then you say, oh, when we're talking to our young person that may be in the cusp or may be involved, we start to explore if they're already don't do not feel safe do they know where they, do you do they know where you live um does your, you know all of these are big conversations um which may lead to a relocated situation we've relocated people um with saint giles trust with working with agencies to move the family because they're they've been threatened by the um um by the gang We've moved, we've, we've, we've done angel recovery where we tried to pay off the debt one time and get that young person out, you know. In my position where I am, and I don't say this with my lanyard, if I know a young person, if a mum calls me today, if my mum, if a mum calls me today and she says, I just found £2,000 worth of drugs in my young person's possessions, what are we going to do? Yeah. That's a whole discussion, but I'll tell you what I would do, and I'm just not even with my lanyard. Oh, I'm telling that to that package needs to be given back to that young to that drug dealer. You take your young person and never talk to that person again. I've seen it work wonders. Essentially, you say you have two, you have ten minutes. You tell your young person to tell the gang, my mom's found the drugs. You have ten minutes to take these drugs back, or my or the police get involved, and you'll see how quick these gangs come. They take the drugs and they leave the kid alone. I've seen it happen. And why we do it like that? I've told police officers the same thing is because if that money, if that drug goes missing, those drugs get flushed down the toilet by the mum. That's panicking, or gets given to the police. Essentially. That police, that those drugs are gonna just get seized, locked away, nothing gonna be done with it. But your young person is essentially gonna be on the crossfire for the next year, being watched, being stalked, being followed, being threatened because they owe the this gang man this gang money. Yeah, I wish you had time to talk about that. But I wanted to share that because sometimes you're gonna be in lived react, you're gonna be in lived scenarios, and it's gonna you're gonna have to think what is the best well being for this young person. Debt bondage is. Is, is 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 ruining so many people's lives debt bondage so i say that um from a personal opinion um yeah time is going but we're having fun 
we're having fun we're having fun so all right cool so there's so much guys um i'm gonna leave it there what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna just give you a quick scan have a read these are the signs and indicators this is just a conclusion for everything we've been looking at today sorry the signs and indicators is essentially all right with all this negative stuff what can we do on our daily work that we should watch out for you know we've spoken about the young person going missing for numerous days um and essentially um um this is what this is essentially so we're seeing that young people going missing question it young person going missing for numerous days numerous nights they're saying they're at a friend's house questioning all of these things are things to watch out for i can't go through them but um a lot of these things we've spoken about the slang terms the behavior of our young people the things in their possession you know um there's like the language with i've talked about g packs and other slang terms like conch ot all of these things are here um so yeah that's going to be in your resource pack so you can see that as well um yeah and yeah i'll just how did i get out of it um yeah let's do questions quickly um how did i get out of it in 2016 i lost two of my friends in two ways uh one of them was murdered and one of them was incarcerated for a long time he's still there uh my friend's name was akeem oh, i just remembered it's blurred but underneath the blur blur there's a picture of akeem on my wall um akeem was a really good friend of mine uh i spoke um yeah he was murdered he was shot in his head closed casket um we didn't we didn't get to bury him up for like it took like 30 plus days before we got back the body i remember throughout that whole process i couldn't speak to his mum i remember me as a confident and outspoken person as you guys have learned today i remember just being so confused i didn't know what to do and it was weird because we associate death well were closely associated with death in this lifestyle but him being so close and the time it happened i think it hit me differently and in the space of akeem not even being buried we then lost christopher my other friend who was mur um who was incarcerated he was arrested for a firearm so just the i don't know this or that that just put put me in a place of reflection i remember i was i was depressed i'm i'm how old how, how old was i then i would have been 20 going on 21 this is 2016 so this was five years ago i'm 26 years old and i remember in that year i remember just thinking <laughs> i don't i just didn't know what i feel call it a midlife crisis or whatever um what is life and what is the meaning and i say it to the young people there's three ways you can go in this lifestyle and it happens no matter what a hundred percent it always happens you either go prison you either die or you lose your mind and people try to sneak away from those other two so they think oh they're going to get away with it no you'll still lose your mind you will see things you'll experience things you'll feel alone you'll see life grow your childhood friends grow and move on in things and you will just be there in your thoughts in the trauma yeah and that was happening to me even though I hadn't been arrested, like, um, well, per prosecuted, I've been arrested numerous times, even though I hadn't been prosecuted for my offences, I really felt that free take place. I was anxious, I was heavy, I was confused, I was sad. The money that I was counting didn't affirm me. I've moved out of my violent household, I've got my own place, and I'm doing well, yeah, but it wasn't enough. And I just remember in that moment just needing to escape. And... Um, yeah, so I heard this word called change. It really, in my head, I wanted to just, I just knew, it was like I just, it's like I just maxed out everything I was doing, so I just wanted to change. And and this is not, this isn't um, unfamiliar. Kids want to change all the time. Everyone wants to change. You have a moment, but what do you do with that moment? And in that moment, I just remember just going to, um, going to a friend, and that friend really saw what I was going through, and that friend really just supported me and um yeah he started and then a lot of things happened um my christian faith played a big part my christian faith really saved me um counseling i got counseling um uh reconciliation in the space of that i was coached to talk to family members so i had to forgive Ka and i just started and then i was a musician i'm still a musician but i used to glamorize this lifestyle and essentially i just said I don't want to glamorize it anymore. So I remember I spoke publicly about my change. Like, I mean, confession wise, I think confession's important. So I'm saying, young people, you want to change? Yo, you got to talk to your teacher. You got to say it. You're accountable now. 
And I remember that helped um, as well. And then I started to get invited to stuff like BBC. I spoke on BBC. I got a documentary at BBC called Life, Crime and Trauma that came out in 2019. Um, and then that got me to talk on Channel 4. And then fast forward, I've spoken in Houses of Parliament four times. And then on the third time, this is all what I'm changing, you know. I still have these weird habits. Like, I'm <laughs> but I remember the third time I was spoken in the Houses of Parliament, I met my mentor of today, uh, who I'm going to see tomorrow. Uh, and he's the same age as my dad. And he's, uh, he's uh, you can Google him, Michael Hastings, incredible man. And um, he just fathered me. Uh, and um, that was a huge help. And he saw, he saw, he saw something in me, and all of these things. I just felt seen. And why I say this so importantly, because love is powerful. You know, if you look at a kid with hope, purpose, like every kid that I'm mentoring today, I'm like, they can be so jarring and annoying. But if I sit down and I'm like, bro, I care for you more than you care for yourself. I don't care because I groomed kids. I saw kids that didn't see nothing, and it was so easy to push them to the bad, to the bad. But if we can change that with that same essence and look at these kids and say, look, I see it and it may not happen overnight. But when it does, when they have that moment of change, if we grab onto it and we start to pour all the love and care we can, I believe it can change wonders. I've seen it happen to all these young boys around me. Um, so, yeah, uh, it was a progressive change. Um, so that's how I got out. Uh, <laughs> um, people ask me do you feel safe now um, yeah I do um, I feel I was fortunate that when I was out um, I was working for myself I had my own operation so I dismantled that and I kind of spoke out against it um, I, I didn't have debt so I was fortunate um, so I'm not ignoring the fact that it is difficult for other people to change um, however it starts with them yeah, I'll finish with this. Look at the, you'll get this in your pack as well. Look at this uh, final thought. There's three elements to change. A young person cannot change unless they desire to change themselves. That's one. If you're working with a young person, they're stressing you out, they're not moving, they're not responding, they're not listening, don't kill yourself. They need to desire themselves, just like I did. However, when they do desire to change, two and three takes place. What's number two? A young person cannot change unless they have something to change to. We need to tell them that. We can't make them change, but we can tell them who they can be. We can signpost. We can point them to the right direction. And then number three happens. A young person cannot change until they have someone to walk them through the change. It doesn't work if we just point them to the direction. We've got to take their hand and walk them through it because they'll get tempted. You know, I mean, times my phone rang and people were offering me better opportunities than what the legal sector was offering me. I had to decide and I had people that I was accountable to that said no. This is what you remember what you said. Remember you didn't want to remember what you said to Akeem's mother at, at the eulogy. Remember what you said you want to represent in your life. Remember that. Because we all we often forget. And this isn't just in terms of crime, this is us in life. We forget things. And it's so important that we hold on to it and we we file that day by day. And um, yeah, so those are the three elements. We can only do two and three, but I promise you, if we are ready. By the, on the sidelines to give these kids two and three. We let them know even when they're doing the craziness. We're saying, yo, remember there's this college for you. Remember there's this football opportunity for you. Remember there's this person that wants to meet up with you. Yeah, you don't need to smoke, uh, smoke that much. We celebrate the small wins. I've seen it work wonders. And it isn't a, it isn't a day, it isn't an overnight thing. It's, it's a trialing thing. And that's why I said this lanyard will never... I was doing this way before I started to partner with St. Giles. I'm going to be doing it way after when I'm finished here. So, um, yeah, that's how, that's how I'd finish. <laughs> um, for, oh, you lot are writing nice messages in the chat. Oh, look at that. What's going on? Uh, oh, thank you, guys. What's going on? Oh, don't do that to me. Going to make this black man blush. Damn. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I'll read that. I'll screenshot that. It's a, the, fill, fill in the feedback form. Um, guys, I'm really, I, I really try professionalism wise. I don't want to abuse the time. Um, but yeah, I'm really sorry um, that we've gone over time um, and we didn't get to finish and go into detail with other themes. But it's a two hour session. I do this in half a day training. I do three, I do two day training on this. Um, so yeah, and two hours is the the shortest time we do 
Um, if you would like to get in touch um, in regard to signposting a young person, maybe you have someone that you think could benefit with St. Giles's service um, in terms of mentoring, come going into the school, please do get in touch with SOS plus admin at St. Giles Trust the all.uk. Um, you can take a picture of that or you can write it down. Um, essentially, um, yeah, and um, what I want to do, um, Kellyanne, are you there? Um, what I want to do is give you some resources. So the slides um, that we've gone through today and also um, even some links. I just mentioned my, um, I just found out recently it's been taken off BBC iPlayer, but um, there's an extract of my documentary on YouTube that may be helpful. So I will attach that um, as well. Yeah, if you want to just leave your emails in the chat, I'll send it to you guys directly um so yeah i'll send that to you guys and if again if you want to ever get in touch if there's relevant work you think um you could benefit with myself um or saint giles please do my artist name is still shady um i'm gonna put it in the chat i should have put it in caps because it looks cooler um i'm my artist name is still shady feel free to just google that and um youtube that and essentially um, it can be a relevant resource, perhaps, just in terms of positive music or um, just a part of my story. There's something called My Testimony, uh, which even talks about my story in a bit more of a soft approach. It's a more softer approach, um, but it's definitely a 10-minute 